Good morning, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to Denver, Colorado. We are midway through day two of our two days of coverage here on theCUBE. My name is Savannah Peterson in another John sandwich for this segment, but initially joined by John Furrier. John, this morning has been so fun. Great, this Flying next guest by. is going to have all the data on the global landscape. I'm loving this segment. Geopolitics, Prime Lines. John, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Welcome for to the me. show. Thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. I got so excited when we sat down and immediately started talking about different nation states and threats. I'm just going to go big picture here. What's the biggest threat to our domestic cybersecurity today? Well, I think that most people would agree that there's a, that the multi threat activity is probably the biggest threat right now. So, what that is is basically uh, the Chinese espionage or the cyber espionage is coming out of China that where they're digging into our critical infrastructure, they're essentially gaining access to water, power, rail, all these really critical spaces. Um, and um, the job there is like they're waiting, they're basically digging in so that if they get the order, they can disrupt, right? And so there's a scenario where uh, like a military operation kicks off and they go in and start disrupting our critical infrastructure. Uh, the really, really disconcerting thing it's, that it's been going on lately with it, though, is that um, they've, they're moving away from to sort of uh, military-focused critical infrastructure or a critical infrastructure that's re highly related to, let's say, the ability of the military to mobilize, and, and they're hitting a lot of random things, so more more random things, and um, that means you know, just about anybody could be kind of a victim, or you know, a lot of different industries right. could be a victim, and, and that's a major concern of ours. Definitely. Is, is disruption the, at the tactics just overall chaos? Yeah, like so they get in your industrial control systems or your OT systems and start breaking things, right? And it's really chaos. I think that's a really good way to think about it. Uh, we're going to get all that stuff working again, right? You know, I doubt that people are going to get, it's not really a violence thing, it's more of a disruption thing, right? What, what's changed on the leaderboard? Last year you guys had stack ranked some names. Can you give us China still number one? I think give us the ranking. ranking. The breadth of activity that we see, they have so many different play, players or operations going on at all times. And then the really, really aggressive nature of the Volti phone activity, I think that makes it, puts it probably up a, a pretty high on our list. Uh, they're not the only the only player that we're really worried about. You know, Russia's done a lot of interesting things the last year. Um, they're targeting technology firms, for instance, um, really all the way from the top biggest to the smallest. And I'm talking hypervisors down to resellers uh, to get down basically to leverage their access to their customers. And so we're seeing uh, you know we're seeing a lot of that that we, we're really concerned about too. When you say that, let's just dig in there a little bit with that Russian example. Is that so that they can? poses those businesses to everyday customers like us on the other side? It's it's basically leveraging your access to those customers. So oh, yeah. if you're a reseller and you have credentials to, let's say the, the systems that you set up or sold, they're going to leverage those credentials to get downstream to your customers, yeah. right? Uh, the whole game is basically moving upstream, right? And so the really good players, that's what their game is, right? They want to constantly sort of move to this to these positions where they can pick and choose the victims that they want. I mean, every entry point, there's no downside to any of these guys. They just get in, yeah. they go to a dead end, okay, try another one. Try another one, yeah. find another opportunity, and there's plenty yeah. of dead So companies can't really make a mistake once, but yeah. the hackers can make a mistake all the time. Who cares? Just I think that's in. a really important thing to think about. It. We, sometimes we, there's the concept of like the uh, offensive advantage, and I think it's, it's very real because uh, you know, they can get caught, and they just they'll just retool and go right back at it. Yeah. Right? It's a it's a tough problem. What do companies do? Because obviously, there's a lot of re-movement, reconstitute the teams. So that the bad guys are doing that. Companies don't want to make a mistake. What can they do to prepare with all this upstream activity? Uh, what's your advice to the companies to protect themselves with well, all these threat the, actors? The most important thing to do is you have to build a security program that's that's designed to respond to a changing actor, right? And I, I absolutely believe in uh, best practices, right? And we absolutely have to do best practices, but you cannot build a security program, you can't manage risk without having any idea who the bad guy is, right? Yeah. And you need to really start thinking about what are the threats to your organization, because everybody has a different threat picture, and start and, and work your way backwards and prioritize the things that matter most to you. Um, and I think that's a really the best way to the best way to go about all of this. Uh, Kevin said on his keynote yesterday, accept risk. And I think I, I won't say tell you she. He's not a tell you she kind of guy. He said it directly. And then it's about accountability. How do you assign risk when you have changing landscape, changing tactics? 
I mean, I can sign up and say, hey, I'll take the risk as long as I don't get breached. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. but who owns it? So how do you do that? How does a company say, how do you assign the risk or to the teams? I mean, I, well, yeah, I think you have to look at the you know matter of impact and yeah. likelihood, right? Um, yeah. If you are running, let's say like we're just talking about say the supply chain threat moving through this. Well, if you're a technology company, uh, somebody targeting you to get to your customers is actually a really bad, almost existential scenario, right? And that's a high major impact scenario. So, what's the likelihood of it? Well, it depends on you know who's coming after you and why they would come after. You. And it might even depend on who your customers are, right? If your job is to sell, you know, flour to bakers or something like that, you may not be a high priority. <laughs> if you're selling to the defense industrial base, you're on somebody's list. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 people are curious. I, <laughs> actually, let's let's dig in there. So when we're talking about on somebody's list, do you find that the the lists or the the approach tends to follow geopolitical lines? For example, North oh, Korea. Yeah. So yeah. can we talk about that? Can you talk a little bit about the trends you might see in say North Korea versus Russia versus in Iran? So uh, Iran, for instance, Iran's been incredibly busy in in Israel since the beginning of the the conflict there. Um, Companies that are headquartered there, that are doing business there. We've even seen companies that are uh, building industrial control system components be targeted on a global level just for, by the fact that they're Israeli associated. So the geopolitics re absolutely factors into the targeting that goes on there. Um, I, you know, when it comes to Russia, uh, we're, we're obviously concerned about what's going on in Ukraine, but um, the cyber element doesn't really end at, at that border, right? Uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of strong focus there. You may not be an Eastern European com company, but you may have a lot of assets or business there, or interest there. You know, one of the first things when the war began, I got a call from a customer and, and who told me that uh, they had been affected by an attack that was really focused on Ukraine, but it just sort of escaped the boundaries of Ukraine. Yeah. One of the most expensive incidents in history was the NotPetya incident. Um, and it was actually focused on Ukraine, but it still managed to break global yeah. shipping, production of vaccines, yeah. Oreos weren't getting to shelves. It yeah. was a, it was a My major gosh. incident. I mean, it's a, that's <laughs> it's a, a cyber war right yeah. there for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what is, the, what is the prognosis? What's the the cyber war thing is real? You know, I've been a big hawk on this on theCUBE, you know that um, this, there's physical war and then there's digital war. We got to protect ourselves here in the U.S. with companies that got to build their own militia, basically, to protect themselves. How is the government aligning on this? And and the public is has the public-private partnerships kind of figured out how to fill the void? Um, and so, what what's your take on this? And People want to know. People start to figure out, like, okay, so I see that all this cyber disruption that yeah. affects my air, my airline, like Oreos, and you're like, what the hell? How do we get here? Well, I'll tell you, there's there's really two sides to the coin. The first side is that, um, I mean, the, the bad news is that unfortunately, when it comes to cyber war, a lot of it it takes place in the private sector, right? At least it's in the United States. The private sector controls most of the critical infrastructure. So if we get into a military engagement right anywhere, the response could be in cyber, and, this, and that response can very well be against the private sector. That's the bad news. The good news is that a lot of the cyber, sort of disruptive, destructive cyber activity is not actually about practical effects. The good news is a lot of these things can get repaired and brought back online ultimately, right? What they're really often trying to do is scare us, I was right? Say they're trying optics, to break yeah. things, right? They're trying to break things for a short period of time to make us think that we can't trust the things that we rely on, right? It's actually the same threat for the elections, right? My concern is not that somebody's going to yeah. break the election, right, or change the outcome of the election. My concern is somebody's going to change our trust in the election, right, or affect our trust. And that's where a lot of this activity is really So it's about. a cultural impact. Yeah, yeah it's a psychological impact. I mean, we impact. see it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. we see it already. Psychops all the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the era of fake news has been quite an example of that, and that's not even a cyber attack. Yeah. That's a outright lies on blog posts, I think. Well, I but think it's, it's a good example, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good example of how serious this can be, right? That, yeah. like. They, they recognize there's opportunity. We're demonstrating on a regular basis, and they're yeah, going to try to take advantage of that. Deep fakes is great, and having your boss think you're supposed to send a wire of $10 million to... Well, that's a, yeah, the other interesting thing that we have to deal with now is, unfortunately, the idea of, uh, of adversaries using AI. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing more and more pickup of that yeah. in the criminal space and in the, in the uh, espionage space. Has the, has the um, global stage, in terms of politics, 
started to recognize the state movement because remember the early Mandian conversations we had a couple of years ago where you know, they're using open source tools to kind of off book run stuff, but now you're starting to identify you guys are doing a great job doing that. Has that elevated up the conversation oh, onto the global stage? Absolutely, I think it, one of the important things I think that we do is, is, is try to get this information out of the, into the global space. You know, when I first started doing this a long time ago, yeah. one of the issues that was going on is that uh, Chinese side restaurants particularly was targeting the, the commercial sector, the private sector. Yeah. Uh, the government would knew about it, but the government had never publicly talked about espionage, right? That was not a thing yeah. the government felt comfortable doing. And so you end up in a situation where the government knew a lot about what was going on. They were, didn't want to talk about it, but they weren't being the ones, they weren't the ones being affected. And so nobody was having this conversation in the private sector. And we've shifted a lot of that. This conversation is happening in public now. Yeah. And I think it needs to stay that way. What do you think, what do you think was that shift? Because we were talking about kind of the, the, the quiet secret, you know, cybersecurity didn't want you to know about cybersecurity for a minute. And nobody yeah. wants to know there's, there's potential threats or risk or whatever. I, what do you think has brought the community together as much? Because it's very, very much been the same in the whole week in the last couple of years. I think the APT1 report was, it was groundbreaking, right? It was essentially a, a public statement that this stuff is going on, it's comprehensive, it's getting a, a lot of the private sector, um, and that, and that, that, that you know, we, it's time to essentially yeah. start organizing it and, and, and fighting back. As a veteran in the industry, you guys do great work, props to you guys, but as an individual, you put your kind of citizen hat on. What's changed the most from last year to this year, and what do you expect this year coming up going forward? Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that's changed, I think, is, is just been as adversaries continuing to adapt to, to, to our, uh, our efforts. Um, I talked about the APT1 report. Uh, the adversary that we were talking about then is, is unfortunately way better than they, they were then, right? Yeah. It was unusual for them to come right out of a Shanghai net block or something like that. It was it wasn't unusual for them to use sort of bottom dollar tactics. Uh, it, it, the stuff that they're doing now is far better. Uh, I talked to you guys, I think, last yeah. year about yeah. the zero day tactics. Yeah. They're continuing to get good at their innovating. Yeah, and there's, we've seen so many more since last time I talked to you. Uh, I think we've seen like six this year, and I think we're going to see another six before the year's out. So they're up in their uh, game. Yeah, they're absolutely. Um, you mentioned uh, the incident go, or that the FBI had been involved yeah. in. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the major evolutions we're seeing. They're essentially creating these ephemeral botnets uh, out of people's, it was compromising people's home routers, right? And so, uh, the, you know, like literally APT is coming from somebody's house into a target and they're changing it up constantly. And that means that at for network files. indicators are, are disappearing, like they're harder and harder to detect yeah. them. It's just, it's definitely a bigger challenge than it's ever been. It's about game theory involved, a lot of hunting, Absolutely. automated hunting, automated red teams. Yeah. I'm curious specifically because you mentioned AI and espionage, how, how is AI enabling either both the nefarious side of that and then our defense against it? So I, I personally believe it will be a bigger boon for us as defenders than, than uh, offense. We love to hear but, that. But offense is, is de our offense is definitely taking advantage of it. The biggest place that they're taking advantage of it is the ability to fabricate content, right? Video, audio, uh, text, you name it. They can create these fake pe people on social yeah. media and they use that for social engineering. It's a huge boon for social engineers. Uh, if you think of like a North Korean or an Iranian uh, social engineering attack, yeah, it used to be a lot of a lot of the activity was you know a one day attack that sent you one mes message and then hopefully you'd click on something. We're seeing them take like a, a month now to work somebody over. That takes a lot more fake content, and AI is allowing the, uh, enabling them. The good news though, on the opposite side though, is it's, a, it's an incredible tool for cybersecurity. It's really good at finding anomalies. It's really good at breaking down code. I ran a cyber espionage intelligence team. A big thing that we did was reverse engineering malware. And we, we've we been able to use AI to do some incredible stuff in the reverse engineering space. It, it, we're talking about it's taking days off of the, the time to respond to something. It's really incredible. So it's a double-edged sword, but it's good news for us. It is, it's, I think it's a good way to think about it. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I absolutely love that. You brought up something that I think is really important. I think if folks maybe not as deep in cybersecurity as we all are, they think an, uh, a, a hack or something happens, I think, much quicker. You're talking about people embedding in systems for a very long time. Some of these bad actors hanging out. Yeah. Oh, I mean, a, a month is one example, but even years. How, oh, yeah. How long 
do you think nefarious bad actors are are acting on average before we end up seeing some of these bigger well it's interesting in- we, we track dwell time and and that the sort of a, 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 a piece there you have like there's really two two types of are two sides of the, the coin espionage actors want to stay there they want to hang in there they want to gather as much intelligence as quietly as possible but on the other side uh, ransomware actors have kind of broken that theory because they want to be in and uh, they want to be ransom and you as soon as, as, soon as possible. Out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right? And so what's really interesting is we know now that on average it takes about 48 hours for them to get into place to disrupt a network. Um, but because they've been, the, the new piece of this game is, is the extortion element and the leaking element, we now know that they'll spend actually like three times as long on a target just to get that data. Because that data is so valuable when it comes to negotiating uh, a ransom. People will pay to yeah. keep to protect their and brain, they engineer right? the, Oh, yeah, absolutely. They know, they know the alternative to negotiating the payment. So they know the, they do the math and saying, well, this is the number. That's the number. And then I can tell you, we know that they're like hiring MBA types on the criminal side yeah. to figure those numbers <laughs> out. Oh, yeah. 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 Their targeting is very smart. Cost they know to what defend versus yeah. payout. Insurance, they're thinking about all those defend, things on their side. Defend, recover. Yeah. It is um, sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's extortion. Yeah, absolutely. John, thanks so much. Wow. Oh, yeah, extortion, espionage, we've covered it all. I wish we had more time, John. Thank you for giving us Thank the time you. that you could. Always a pleasure to talk about this kind of cool cyber warfare stuff with you, John. It's going to be in our movie. I, I know it is. It's good. Be it's script's movie. writing itself. And I know that all of you tuning in wherever you might be are enjoying this as much as we are. Day two of coverage here at MIs in Denver, Colorado. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for enterprise tech news.